that's not talked about much. And that is that Jesus was more than likely crucified naked. What we see in the pictures and the videos and such with the loincloth or for our comfort and not necessarily historical realities. It's pretty well established that Romans crucified people naked to bring the greatest possible shame. In fact, I've included those references in the outline in the description. If you'd like that, just click that. No email needed, just click it and it's yours. I just wanna get the resources into your hands. So this wasn't new and was practiced throughout history. The focus of the groin to cause pain among a torturing process was practiced by the Syrians and practiced by other civilizations, practiced by the Romans. And yeah, it was just part of the culture. And sorry guys, if you are watching this, sorry. The question then becomes about, what about the women at the cross? Would they have been at the cross if Jesus was naked? Well, most of the women were watching from a distance. What detail that most leave out is that Mary and the others were among those watching from a distance. We see this in Matthew and we see this in Mark. The only difference is, and the only challenge is, we come to John and he said near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister Mary, and the wife Clopas and Mary Magdalene, these women that the other gospels say were among the women standing at a distance but john says they were near and when jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby he said to her woman here's your son well we have to understand that near is a relative term but we know that of the women mary was close enough that jesus spoke to her and his disciple john now this isn't too big of a surprise because being his mother and raising him and john a man and disciple it may have been more appropriate that they were near enough to talk with jesus we don't see other women talking to Jesus, which may mean they were among the other women, which was a distance away, but still near compared to the rest of the townspeople. Now, some have said since Jesus was Jewish, the Romans would have wanted to treat Jesus differently and have covered him to respect the Jews. Well, I'm not sure of that because the Romans who crucified Jesus hated the Jews. In fact, Josephus in the 70s spoke of mass crucifixions that were motivated out of the wrath and hatred they bore the Jews. This was not a new thing in AD 70. This had been going on for centuries. There was definite hatred between the Jews Romans, but more than that, the Jewish leaders hated Jesus as well. They rejected him as not one of their own. So I would have to say, first of all, there was little reason to give Jesus special privileges considering he was hated by both Romans and Jews. Secondly, crucifying naked was standard shaming practice for the Romans. In fact, Michelangelo even made a statue of this of the naked Jesus. And third, the point of the cross was maximum suffering and humiliation. They weren't trying to go easy. They were trying to intensify and maximize humiliation as much as possible. And four, even Jews at times punished criminals naked. So it wouldn't have been out of the ordinary. You can see that reference in the outline. And number five, mockery and blows in the groin were common focal points in making criminals suffer. And that has happened throughout history. Here's the significance. Jesus knew sexual abuse. He knew what it was to be mocked, violated, humiliated, and abused. Jesus understands. In 1968, the foot of a crucified man named Yehohanan was discovered, and it changed our understanding of crucifixion in two surprising ways. Then a later discovery in 2014 of a second heel bone discovery added to that. The first surprise was the location of the nail. Prior to this discovery, it was uncertain where the nail was placed in the foot when someone was nailed to the cross. Was it through the front as it appears in most art and images of today? What was found with the 1968 discovery was that the nail went through the heel from the side. This meant that the crucified victim had to have had his knees turned completely to the side or that his legs were spread open and the heels fixed or that his feet straddled the cross, his or her feet were nailed on each side. The challenge comes in that the nail that was used was max around 19 centimeters and seven and a half inches long. It would have been difficult to have doubled the heel bones together, driven the stake through both heels, and yet still be deep enough in the wood that it held the body. Yet it could have been possible if they smashed the heels very hard. 
A discovery in 2014 reinforced that crucifixion did indeed pound the nail through the heel bone. But what was interesting in this discovery was that the nail went from the inside to the outside of the heel. This left only two possibilities. The victim's knees were turned to the right and the heels were nailed to the beam or that the victim had to spread his legs wide, fully exposing his genitalia and the spike put through each foot on one or both feet. Either way, the victim's positioning would have significantly added to their misery and especially the difficulty of breathing. The second surprise, and even more astonishing, was that bits of olive wood in the 1968 discovery were found on the end of the nail. This means that Yehohanan was likely crucified on an olive tree, or the cross was made out of cut olive wood. This would make sense as olive trees were a common form of wood at the time. What makes this surprising is that the olive trees do not grow exceedingly tall, nor are they very straight. This would mean that there's a likelihood that the crucified victim was not high up on a pole, but rather at or just above eye level. It would be the torture on the ground being so close, but so far. But some will say, well, what about Matthew 27, where it says, immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. This wouldn't be too surprising that the soldier extended a staff for Jesus to drink. The typical angry person being crucified would have eagerly spit on any Roman soldier that came close or urinated on them. It was wise for a Roman soldier to keep a bit of distance if he didn't want to be desecrated himself. Crucifixion was the worst torture device the Romans implemented to try to deter others from going against Rome. At any moment, Jesus could have called upon the angels to deliver him, but he stayed. The cross was the only way to deal with the sin of humanity and for those he loved to be restored eternally. Scripture says this, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Did the nail that crucified Jesus go through the wrist or his hand? Look at any number of artist renditions of Jesus' crucifixion and you'll see that it's debated. So let's think through this based on three historical patterns. Number three, the word used for wrist in scripture in ancient times was anything from the elbow on down. It could have been in the palm, but it also could have been on the wrist. Number two, when nailing the body to the cross, if the stake was nailed through the palms, it would have had to have broken the tiny bones in the hand. This would have greatly increased the likelihood that when the victim passed out, his body weight could have caused him to flop off the cross, something that no Roman would want to have to mess with. But if the stake went through the wrist, the radiance and ulna were strong enough bones that that could have supported the body. And number one, the median nerve is along the wrist. Piercing the nerve would have been maximum pain. While the Romans may not have known the specific anatomy of the wrist, they certainly, with their vast experience in crucifixion, would have known that this was a location of great pain. Now, they may have used ropes as well to secure the person to the cross, but again, they would have not have wanted someone to slip out, so likely it was nails or a combination of nails and rope. If you've ever struggled with an addiction, be it porn, food, alcohol, whatever, then what happens on the cross at this point may be a comfort to you. Twice Jesus was offered wine on the cross. Now he didn't have anything against wine, in fact his very first miracle was turning water not just into any wine, but the very best of wines. But there's more to the story. The first time Jesus was offered wine, it was mingled with gall, Matthew says, and Mark adds it was mixed with myrrh. After tasting it, Jesus was unwilling to drink it. So was it mixed with myrrh or was it mixed with gall? And why didn't you want to drink it? Well, the Hebrew word myrrh means bitter and gall is another expression for bitter. Whatever was added was a bitter element to the wine. Now, if myrrh was used, as Mark would suggest, it's an aromatic used in perfuming, but it also tastes very bitter, not unlike perfume today. Or they may have another bitter substance other than myrrh, and these were just words to describe what was added was bitter. But there was a purpose to this mixture. The Babylonian Talmud, which is a source of Jewish religious law and theology, states that when one is led out to an execution, he is given a goblet of wine containing a grain of frankincense in order to benumb his senses. The noble women in Jerusalem used to donate and bring it. 
And this is what we see. We see women near the cross. My theory is that the Roman soldiers were supplied plenty of wine for their work of crucifixion. They would need to, to numb their conscience, to do such a heinous act, even if it was part of their duty. Then the women of the family would come with a numbing agent that could be mixed in a jug and offered to the dying to numb the pain. Now when Jesus tasted the wine and the bitter element added to it, he probably knew right away what was happening. As an act of mercy, the women were trying to help ease his pain. Drink this. It will dull your pain. But Jesus immediately refused, and it seems he did so as he wanted nothing to lessen the journey he had to face. No, it will numb my wits, and I must have them all. The second time Jesus was offered wine was near the end of the death. We don't read that this wine had the bitter elements, the numbing elements added, but rather it appears to be the original wine vinegar drink that was common among the Romans. This time he accepted. He needed to as he was thirsty and needed to hang on just a little bit longer as he had something to say. So he took the wine on a sponge which would have given him just enough to wet his mouth for his final words. Now here's the encouragement. In the most intense suffering, Jesus was offered a substance to numb his pain and suffering. If anyone would have had an excuse, it would have been him. But he said no. Instead, he suffered in every way that man did, and because of that, he is able to sympathize with our weaknesses. Have you ever had something wholly violated? Like someone scammed you or someone you know, or your house has been robbed, or something important to you was cast aside. If you have, you know the righteous indignation that rises up within you when the holy is desecrated. At the crucifixion of Jesus, John observes something that the other gospel writers don't mention, probably because John was the one at the cross near Mary and the others weren't. But when Jesus was marched through the streets, he was clothed. That changed when they arrived at the crucifixion site. If you haven't seen the video, Crucified Naked, you might want to check that out. I put a link in the description. At the cross where Jesus was stripped bare, he may have had five articles of clothing that the soldiers took. Perhaps his outer tunic, a shawl, a belt, sandals, and then the inner tunic. It wasn't specified, and we really don't know for sure. It could have just been his outer tunic that was torn into four pieces. Regardless, the Roman soldiers divided his clothes up and cast lots to see who would get what. But then the Gospel of John mentions an added detail, a seamless undergarment. Why did he mention this? Now the Roman soldiers debated how to handle this piece of clothing. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Now the Catholics say that this was a sign that he was acting as a high priest. They base this upon two scriptures, the first in Exodus 28 where it says, The priestly garment shall have in it an opening for the head with a woven binding around the opening, like the opening in a garment that it may not be torn. And Ezekiel 44 where it says, When they go out into the outer court where the people are, they are to take off the clothes they have been ministering in and are to leave them in the sacred rooms and put on out other clothes so that the people are not consecrated through contact with their garments. While it can't be entirely ruled out, for me it seems a bit of a stretch. If you look at the context of Exodus 28, the ephod was a woven garment on the outside, not an undergarment. And secondly, in Isaiah 44, 19, it seems to indicate that they put on and off the priestly garments at the temple. Jesus was rested on an ordinary day, not when he was carrying out a priestly duty. And third, if Jesus had been wearing a priestly garment, the priests calling for crucifixion would more than likely have mentioned it in outrage and extreme jealousy. Instead, at Jesus' trial, they were working hard to come up with an accusation that would stick, not that he was posing as a high priest. Most importantly, John tells us that this is the fulfillment of Psalm 22:18, and that they would divide up his garments. This is one more scripture fulfillment showing that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. This is clearly John's intent. But there's also a human level that this event touches. We know that Jesus grew up poor. In fact, he was some of the poorest of the poor. His father Joseph seems to also have died young. And Jesus in his itinerant ministry was living on such little support, it took a miracle literally to pay his taxes. So this garment that was woven in one piece was special. It was either done by the loving hands of his mother or as an expensive gift given to him. Either way, it was out of the ordinary, significant, more than likely a gift. 
My personal guess is that it was probably made by his mother because the very next verse after John quotes this verse about the soldiers gambling for his clothes, he mentions Jesus' mother who was near the cross. And we know from another text that John was with her as well. They together probably struggled to witness this desecration of even his undergarments, which is why I'm guessing that John was the one who noted the special garment. It wasn't enough that they literally stripped Jesus of any earthly dignity, but they also had to violate what was special to him, personally important, a gift. Why, first and foremost, this event is about the fulfillment of scripture showing Jesus to be Messiah. It's also relevant in appreciating Jesus' suffering with ours. Jesus understands what it is for something important to us to be violated in our darkest hour. Pilate did not want to crucify Jesus as he found him innocent. That and his wife was telling him to have nothing to do with the case as she suffered much in a dream about this man. Caught between his wife, his enemies, and his employer, it was a terrible place for this man to be. But because of the custom of a yearly prisoner exchange, Pilate found a way out of his predicament, or so he thought. Tradition would record that he would spend the rest of his life washing his hands, trying to remove his blood guilt of having Jesus crucified. Whether to get back at the Jews or because Pilate himself secretly wondered if Jesus was who he said he was, the Messiah, he had a sign written in the three local languages and placed above Jesus' head, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. This of course made the chief priests furious as they walked by and read it. It made them look weak and corrupt. Don't write King of the Jews, they said, but that this man claimed to be King of the Jews. I think Pilate was angered that the Jews had cornered him with Jesus, and the sign was a way to get back at them. At the same time, I think Pilate did have a holy curiosity about Jesus' identity. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. He refused to give in to the Jews, and like all things Jesus, it was a point of separation. To the Christians, it was truth. To the Jewish leaders, it was an insult. To Pilate, and potentially a genuine curiosity of an innocent holy man. It's still the same question today. Not much has changed. Is Jesus the King of the Jews and the King of Kings? For some he is truth. For others he's an insult. For some just a curiosity that doesn't lead to salvation. Which one are you?